welcome to the show. Uh, it's a beautiful spring day out here. Very excited to get back in the shop. I've actually been uh, not out of the shop, I've been in it, but kind of working lethargically because I got some either stomach bug or food poisoning from uh, uh, basically a food truck. That's what I think did it, so beware of food trucks. And uh, so what we're going to do today, getting back into it here, I happen to be working on making neck blanks like this. This is how I set up the necks in preparation for the hands-on workshops, which by the way, there are now only two spots left for the entire year for the hands-on workshop. So we're actually almost done for the year. And that means pretty soon I'm gonna have to make a new schedule for 2023 so that you guys who still wanna do a course have something to look forward to and sign up for. So stay tuned for that new schedule of dates 2023 and if you're still interested in 2022 there are still those two spots in the fall so this is what we're going to be doing today i'm going to be demonstrating how i go about setting up my neck blanks and in particular doing the scarf joint here all right but first let's get into your questions okay so the first question i have here is from home built workshop that is my buddy Jeff Baker over there. Uh, he have, runs a very successful woodworking YouTube channel and he is just getting started on his first guitar build. He's never, well, that's not true, I'm sorry. He builds a, he's built a lot of electric guitars. This is his first acoustic guitar build. Uh, so if you want to check out Home Built work, Workshop, you can follow his progress on that from a you know, first timer's perspective. Uh, but also coming from the perspective of being an accomplished woodworker and electric guitar maker. So anyway, the question is, Hey Eric, I'm enjoying all your videos and learning a ton as I'm getting into build number one. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge with us. I have a finishing question. Have you ever tried any of the popular oil slash hard wax finishes you see on the market now? Would something like this be suitable on an acoustic instrument? They seem to be super easy to use and wonder, and I wonder if it's an option. So I like this question a lot because what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to kind of punt this out to you guys a little bit here because I've actually, I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about like min wax and, and stuff like that. Um, maybe even wipe on polys and stuff like that, that you can find at Lowe's, Home Depot and stuff like that. Uh, although he does say oil slash hard wax, so yeah, I think he's I think he's talking about like min wax. I think. Now here here's the problem. I have actually never used any of those, which might be surprising to some people because a lot of you guys I know are coming from more of the general woodworking background, getting then into guitar making. And so this is a very relevant question for you guys because you guys probably do have a lot of experience with a lot of those simple uh, hardware store finishes. Uh, I actually, even when I have something that I'm finishing just around the house, um, you know, for my wife or just as part of a home improvement project, I tend to fall back on the fancy guitar finishes that I use, like True Oil or Shellac or something like that. And so I don't actually have direct experience with this, but just kind of throwing it out there, I don't see why you couldn't use something like Minwax, but I'd love to hear what you guys think, if you guys have any experience using, if anybody out there has experience using these these popular, you know, simple Lowe's and Home Depot oil slash hard wax finishes, like Minwax. So please let me know in the comments, let me and Jeff Baker from Home Built Workshop know what your experience is on that my gut tells me it's fine uh it's there's definitely going to be you're going to take a hit tonally finishing you are with finishing you are always taking a hit tonally in some way you're basically like putting a wet blanket on your instrument but it's entirely necessary to put that on there because um the guitar is you know you're talking about 
a thin neck that comes out off of a body that's made up of thin membranes, the top and the back. So the wood is very prone to mo movement, to absorbing and exchanging moisture with the surrounding area. So leaving it without a finish is simply not an option. But a lot of people who are really cued into the tone side of the equation will choose their finish carefully, okay? And generally, if you are concerned with the tone, if you're trying to really optimize tone, you would go with shellac. That is the general, uh, I think that's what most people agree on, is, is that shellac is the least obtrusive to the tone, okay? But everything affects it in some way. And so I'd imagine those oil slash hard wax finishes uh, aren't very good in that regard. In fact, I do know that generally, oil in general, even like a true oil, which I use a lot, um, isn't as good as shellac, tonally, okay? Meaning that it has a little bit more of a dampening effect than shellac does. Um, but that's a great question. It's really a, a pretty deep one too, and I'm hoping uh, I can continue to answer it over future episodes uh, just from getting some feedback from you guys. Okay, next question. Uh, this is from Felipe Malu. I'm not sure how to say that last name. Um, there's that French ending there, which I never know how to pronounce that. So I'm going to say Malu. What controller are you using for the blankets? The LMI one is fairly expensive to me. Are you using one controller while bending two or four sides at a time or four controllers on the four blankets? So in a previous episode, I gave you guys a tour of my side bending apparatus that I have, which includes four separate side bending machines. And to answer your question, Felipe, the control, first of all, the controller that I'm using for my blankets is the one that Blues Creek Guitars sells. Um, John Hall is a good friend of mine up at Blues Creek Guitars. They're actually only like 40 minutes away from me, which is pretty cool. And his controller works great. And I do believe it is le less expensive than the LMI one, but um, that was a long time ago that I bought it, so not really sure. Uh, you could look that up and see. Check it out, Blues Creek Guitars. Are you using one controller while bending two or four sides at a time? So I am bending the sides one at a time on that table. When you see the four different bending machines, it's not that there's some way that I can uh, run all those machines all at once. It's just that I can bend one side with the one controller that I have. I only use one controller. I plug that controller into the thermal blanket for one of the machines, I do the bend, then when that's done, I unplug the controller and slide it over to the next machine, plug that one in, and then I bend that one. When that's done, unplug it, go to the next machine. So it's one controller for four machines, just going one at a time around the circle, um, the you know carousel, as I call it, uh, bending each side by itself. So I hope that answers that question. The next one comes from DALG Guitars. And he says, uh, at 1350 in the video, Eric says, a lot of you guys are doing this out of smaller shops than this. And then he says, LMFAO, we are all doing this out of smaller shops than his is true. I failed to <laughs> recognize that. Uh, going on with his comment, he says, that place is absolutely cavernous and the light in the room with the benches is amazing. Good for you, Eric. I can't think of a better use for that building than a huge guitar shop rock on. Okay, great. So that was just a comment. Um, and it's a good comment and he's right. <laughs> I, I do often mention uh, the caveat that when I'm speaking to you guys about how I do things here, 
there might be a little bit of a disconnect because I have space to set up dedicated workbenches and dedicated setups, dedicated router tables to do specific tasks. And a lot of you guys are working in a different capacity where you have tools and things stored, say, under your bench that you have to pull out, put on the bench, do the work, and then you have to tear the whole thing down and store it away again. And it's definitely um, a different workflow environment that you'd be working out of. So, yeah, I completely agree with his comment there, and I, I appreciate uh, everything he said. Okay, Edward Cotter says, could you vary the counter bore depth to try and equalize string break at the nut? So this is from a video I did on counter boring tuners. So meaning uh, drilling or reaming a, a counter bore, a, you know, sunken cavity for the washers or the head of the tuner to sink into. And to answer your question, Edward, yes, you can. And I think that is something I was thinking of doing. I didn't do it on this guitar because there's just a lot of new things going on. And I, you know, have to, um, have to sort of just proceed on with the build at some point without getting too into analysis paralysis. So I didn't do that with this one, but I want to do that. I like the idea and I might um, at some point in successive builds, I might get into a little bit of that. Now I do want to mention this, doing this, equalizing the string break at the nut is probably splitting hairs a little bit, but we are guitar makers and that's kind of like what we do uh, that, that's kind of like the disease we have in our brains is that we tend to talk about and do projects to attempt to gain like, you know, 0.001% of an improvement in tone. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to pursue you know, really small gains in tone like this, but I really do think this is one of those micro improvements if it helps at all. I will say though, because I know some of you uh, will disagree with me on that, I will say that the at the other side, at the saddle side, that string break angle is actually very, very important. I just think at the nut end, where the tuners are, the string break angle, while still I think it could have an effect of equalizing those string break angles, I don't think it's anywhere near as important as the saddle end. Okay, but I'm open to other interpretations. Spartan Guitarist writes, the hardest thing is seeing my wallet suffer from collecting all these tools that I need. Yes. <laughs> I can uh, certainly relate to that, as can many of you. Um, one thing I can say that will maybe help you is don't feel like you need to collect all these tools all at once. Just pick them up as you go along, as you feel that they're necessary. A lot of times people ask me for a list of tools and I often refuse to give it to them because I don't want it. It's a difficult thing to answer, but also it's not really um, a good recommendation to tell you guys to go out and, hey, buy all these tools. This is everything you'll need to do an acoustic guitar build because there are, frankly, a lot of tools that you're going to need. And there's a lot of different ways that people will go about it depending on um, whether they want to be more power tool heavy or more hand tool heavy. So there's some personal preference there and depending on their shop, the size of their shop, which we just talked about, and uh, also depending on whether they continue to produce, want to continue to produce guitars in a professional capacity or semi-pro, or if they're just doing this one time just to build a guitar. Of course, you're gonna get the tools, the bare minimum tools that you need to just get through um, 
and maybe even just borrow or rent tools if you're just doing one or two builds or something like that, as opposed to really investing in it long term. So it's a hard question to answer. Um, but yes, I agree with your sentiment there. The wallet does suffer. Jim Kutron writes, okay, this is a long one here. Eric, I'm installing my first set of Steinbergers on a Fender-style headstock. I've done a lot of machining in my years as an artist slash craftsman, and the term you are looking for to describe the part of the tuner for which you are countersinking is the shoulder. Yes. Okay, so that's a, what I was saying earlier um, when I said the, you know, the washer and the, the head of the tuner there, which wasn't correct. It's the shoulder. The shoulder of the tuner. I cannot say that I find the installation of these tuners to be without problems. For example, I slotted for the key post pin because the tolerance between... Okay. <laughs> for example, I slotted for the key post... I'm going to show you what he's talking about because I have the tuners right here. Okay. There's actually two parts to the tuner. There's this. Oh, a washer just fell out. There it is. Put that to the side. There's this, and then there's this. So what he, I'm going to put this aside, though, because we don't need that. What he's talking about is this little pin here. See that pin? That is designed to um, lock your tuner in there so that it doesn't rotate, okay? That's to keep it rotating. Think of it as do, serving the same function as a set screw does on normal tuners. All right, let's proceed with that in mind. So that's what he's talking about when he says the key post pin. For example, I slotted for the key post pin because the tolerance between the body diameter and the post is not practical, in my experience, for wood. In addition, the manufacturer suggests a sixteenth of an inch hole for the pin, which is about 0 .075 inch. I assume they expect the pin to expand the hole and provide a secure fit with the pressure of installation. With harder woods or torrified hard maple in this case, compression Forcing the procedure is iffy at best. I think angling the pilot for the pin is a good compromise. Okay, I'm going to pause. Right, it's a long question. I'm going to pause right there to kind of answer that um, or respond to that, really, because it's not a question. I agree with him 100%. So what he's talking about is I, I went through the same experience that he did here with the Steinbergers, where um, I actually did a build before this one also using those Steinberger tuners and for that first one I also came to that conclusion where I followed the instructions exactly for that key post pin and drilled my tried to drill a sixteenth of an inch hole in the location that the instructions tell you to put it and it was basically impossible to do it without the drill bit uh, rolling over into the tuner hole or just kind of breaking off into the tuner hole. So there was no way to gain purchase with that drill bit on that edge because it was too close to the edge. And I think that's what he's describing. So what I did on that first build was after I realized that wasn't working, I actually took a Dremel and I slotted kind of, I think that's what he's describing here, I slotted out those pinholes rather than drilling them. And then on this second build, I realized that I could still use the drill as long as I angle it away. Um, and that way it, it has enough room on that edge to gain purchase onto the wood. And, uh, and then I, I drill my angled hole and I just kind of like he describes force the pinhole in there. And that works, in my opinion, just as well as using a Dremel and slotting those holes. Using the Dremel, though, and slotting the holes just takes a lot more time. Uh, it took me a, a while to install the tuners just because of that sort of laborious step. So, 
Uh, moving on here. Since this is my first experience with the Steinbergers, I chose not to be as aggressive when hammering for location and setting of the pin. I see that my concern may have not been justified. Counterboring for the shoulder is an excellent innovation. Your hand use of the counterboring tool was really a good touch. Like others have commented, I frequently opt for hand control for processes like chamfering. I completely agree with that as well. Uh, there's a lot of situations where a drill, a power drill is warranted. And then there's a lot of situations where you're much better off using something where you can intuitively feel the amount of uh, feel and modulate the amount of pressure and the amount of wood that you're taking off as you go. And that's where, you know, the hand tool touch comes in. Did you have any trouble with chipping out the edge of the hole because of the relatively few teeth on the tool? Yes, actually a little bit. Uh, and not at first because it was still sharp, but because that really wasn't designed for specifically for hand tool use, it was actually designed to be used in a drill press. It, um, there was only only the very uh, bottom most edge was engaging with the wood and since this was a very dense wood it was ebony it was very easy for that bottom edge to become less sharp and as soon as that happened it would tear out just a little bit uh, towards the end of once once I'd get to the last string hole right the last one or two string holes so at first it was perfectly smooth, but I did notice it was starting to get to the point where I'd need to actually sharpen those edges uh, in order to keep doing it if I was to, you know, use it on the next guitar. So it loses a little bit of its practicality because of that. Um, but I think as long as you can keep it sharp, it's a, a fine way of doing it. And you won't get tear out then on that edge as long as it's sharp. I assume your tool is bottom cutting for a flat cut like other counter bores. Well, thank you. You just, I was struggling to define what I was talking about there with the flat cut, but he just did it for me there. That's what I meant. It's not really, um, it's not really meant to be used this way and that's why, but it, it can work this way. You just have to be aware of the limitations. Thanks for the thoughtful and educational video, Jim. Well, thank you, Jim. That was a good question. Oh, this is great. Gary Rosquist. This is in the members forum. So these are students of the online course, uh, Building an OM Acoustic. When you join that course, you also get membership to the members forum where you get to engage with, there's over 400 members in there of the online guitar building school, um, asking questions and having a dialogue back and forth. And uh, I jump in there from time to time as well. So Gary writes, in Eric's latest tutorial on side bending jigs, he commented on plans for a side bending jig. You can purchase plans for the side bending jig at, and he gives this link right here, which I'm gonna be putting on the screen. And this is great because for the longest time, people have asked me about the side bending jigs that I use and uh, whether I had plans for them. A lot of people have asked if I could sell them plans that I could make, uh, but I'm not really, that's not my thing. I don't make plans. I don't have AutoCAD software or anything like that to do that sort of thing. So I've never been able to answer that. And um, he actually found a really good set of plans, which he posted here, which matches almost exactly what my side bending machines look like. So from now on, I can point people in this direction. So if you guys want a solid set of plans for a side bending jig, go to luthierscooltools.com. That's luthierscooltools.com. Check that out. Not at all affiliated with me. I think um, without actually purchasing, having purchased those plans myself, I, I haven't purchased them. 
I think they'll be really good. They look like uh, they they look identical to the jigs that I have. So there you go. Thank you, Gary. John Cook writes, Hello, Eric. I just watched your video on the two binding jigs, and my question is this. Why do you need this? Can't you just handhold the router and carefully climb route the binding channel? My second question is this. Concerning good tone, what is the most... Okay, these are two very separate questions, so let's start with the first one. Um, can't you just handhold the router and carefully climb route the binding channel? No. You can't do it. Well, yes, you can. Uh, your binding channels will not be good. They will be very out of square and very inconsistent as you travel to different parts of, of the guitar. And that's because your guitar body is very out of square and inconsistent. If you recall, you built this not as a square box, but with a radius top and a radius back. Okay? So... If you just take a regular router and place it, uh, you know, with a flush trim router bit to ride against the side, and you place that regular router base on top of your guitar and attempt to run that around, what it's going to do is it's going to latch onto the radius that's on that top because it has that wide base, and it's going to turn itself to follow that radius as much as it can, which angles all your channels, and it angles it differently in different parts of the guitar. And what solves those problems is one, that shoe on the bottom of the uh, binding tower setup, and also the fact that the uh, binding tower cradles the router in a 90 degree orientation at all times. So the orientation of the router isn't subject to the whims of the surface that it's riding along. It stays upright 90 degrees no matter what, and then you just pass the guitar underneath it. Uh, and without getting too deep into how it works, uh, the, the reason that then the guitar doesn't just waffle around um, giving it inconsistent channels is because you load the guitar into a cradle with four posts from which you can set the heights separately in order to level the guitar and make it perfectly level to your table, essentially eliminating the uh, wonkiness. You know, the um, wonkiness is a great word, but... <laughs> It's not always the most accurate word for what I'm describing. To eliminate the, the rock that your guitar would have because of its radius. So between having the carrier underneath, which eliminates the rock of the guitar, and having the router set up permanently at 90 degrees held in the cradle of the binding tower, and as a third final thing that keeps your channels consistent, the base of the router uh, has that shoe which makes it so that the router rides perfectly on the outside edge of the guitar body and it doesn't attach itself or reference itself onto that radius which would force it to tip. Okay. So, it's a difficult thing to describe in words. Um, I love that question, though. I hope uh, that helps some of you guys who were probably wondering the same thing. That's a very common question. So, I hope that description there, maybe if you listen to it uh, again, you know, to kind of let the ideas percolate in, it might start to make, make sense why you do need that binding tower jig or something like it. There's different ways to do this. Uh, there's one way that you, let me say it this way. There's many different ways to skin this cat, but what he's describing simply isn't one of them. You can't just simply take an out of the box router with a flush trim router bit and run it around the body. It's, um, 
you're just not going to get consistent results and your binding is going to look terrible because when you sand it all back in the end, because of those inconsistent channels that it's glued into, when you sand it all back, it'll look dangerously thin in some areas and extra wide in other areas. In other words, it'll look just horribly inconsistent. So that's uh, the binding jigs question. And you know what? That's our last question because uh, I think that's good right there. I think we covered a lot. And I think uh, you guys are probably ready to learn about scarf joints and neck blanks. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so let me start by simply describing what, where, uh, where we're starting from and where we're ending. This is where we're ending. This is what we're going for. We're going to be attaching our headstock piece to the bottom of the neck blank and the heel block to the bottom of the neck blank. Our starting point is these right here. So I have these four which are at the stage where we're ready to fine tune our scarf joint. So I've already cut the scarf joint and double stick taped the headstock piece to the top. And the way, just to give you guys a quick explanation of how I got to this point, is I started out with a single neck blank piece, just this bottom piece here, using a protractor like this one. I set it up to 15 degrees and I mark my cut and then I simply make that cut on the bandsaw. So I just follow my 15 degree line as accurately as I can and it might wander just a little bit but then I make sure I pull myself back onto the line if I do wander a little bit and that's okay. After I make that cut, the piece that comes off which is this top piece up here I cut that down to my headstock thickness. In this case, it happens to be a half an inch. Um, yours might be different. So I, I cut this on the table saw to half an inch, and then I flip it over and stick it onto the top like you see here. This is just held down with double stick tape right now. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take the hand plane and a sanding block between those two tools I'm going to smooth out the plane of the heads of the scarf joint on the headstock piece and this plane of the neck blank piece. And because I fine tune these together like this, they will be perfectly coplanar with each other. Okay? I think that's the right word to use to describe the relationship of those two planes. Um, and then once these two surfaces are perfect, I can then uh, pull this off, this top piece, and it will get glued to the bottom like you see here, giving us a perfect 15 degree angle right here and a nice scarf joint. All right, let's go do that. this up into my vise. And I'm starting out with a block plane here. This happens to be a high angle block plane, um, but a low angle block plane would work fine as well. And pretty sure this one's still good and sharp. So I want to set it up for a nice shallow cut.
And what I'm doing is I'm just planing this a little bit selectively here because if what I'm looking at is the line, uh, this line, this line, and this line right here. So, you know, the very top of our surface, the joint between this double stick taped headstock piece and the main piece and the very edge right here. And all those lines should be reasonably square. And you can take a square and check them, but I say reasonably square because if they're a little out of square, uh, it's not going to kill it. It's not going to ruin your scarf joint. So you don't necessarily have to check it all the time with the square. You can just trust your your visual judgment there if you are the kind of person who has confidence in your ability to judge uh, 90 degrees at least fairly accurately. So you're not going to see me pulling out the square uh, much or at all when I'm doing this. Although, if you, especially when you're getting started, you, you probably should when you're just learning something like this. So that's why I mention it. Okay, and I'm almost done with the plane here. Let's go a little bit more. It's a nice smooth surface. Um, not perfectly smooth though, especially because with the plane, even though the plane can create a perfectly smooth surface, because the surface is wider than the plane itself, you tend to get these tracks from where the very edge of the, uh, the from where the width of the plane ends, right? So it's almost like, you know, you can see like uh, when you get those lawnmower tracks on, on your lawn, it's the same kind of thing. You can see the path that the plane took because you can see where one plane swipe ends and where it meets the next plane swipe. So it's not perfectly smooth right off the plane like it might be if this was a more narrow surface closer to the actual width of that plane blade. So that's where the block comes in. Now we're going to smooth out this surface so we don't have those plane marks in it. Okay, and depending on how much smoothing we, we need here, um, if you're new to woodworking and your hand plane work is very rough, then you might start with 80 grit, which I have on this side of the block. I have 120 grit on this side. Um, actually, I'm going to use a different block. Let me swap this out real quick. Uh, that block is just a very old and used. The sandpaper is very used up. I know this one's a little fresher. So anyway, like I was saying, you have same thing on this block. I've got 80 grit on one side and 120 on the other. I'm going straight to the 120 because that's all this is going to need. It's already pretty close to smooth. And if you really want to have a visual cue as to when you're, uh, when you're there, you can make some pencil marks. <coughs> Should probably be wearing a mask here. Wearing a mask and I can also, because it's a very nice spring day, I can open the door too. Let's get a little more ventilation here. I already have the windows on that side of the shop open for some ventilation. All right. And I'll 
you know, when I turn the camera off, I'll turn the uh, air filters on as well. But um, it, it makes a lot of noise, and while I'm filming, I often just leave those off. So, when you make these marks, now I can sand, and once all the marks, the pencil marks are gone, I can be confident that I've smoothed this plane perfectly. <laughs> Now notice how this block is pretty close to the size of our whole surface here. So it's a good block to use for this. And oh, <coughs> oh man, still got a lot of dust in my throat there. All right, so yeah, notice how this block is close to the same size as this. And also notice how when I'm sanding, there's a technique to it. One, I'm doing circles instead of going back and forth like this, right? Because when you go back and forth like this, especially on a small surface like this, there's a tendency to roll off the two ends here and actually round over your surface. Especially because with that back and forth motion, there's a reversal point on each side. So when I go this way and I stop, there's a tendency for, at, as I stop my motion there, there's a tendency to, in a subtle way, tip the sanding block. And then when I go back the other direction, I'll do the same thing. I'll come to a stop. And as I hit that reversal point, the block kind of uh, wobbles back and forth, right? And that's going to give you not a flat surface, but kind of like a rounded hill, which is not what we want here. Now, if I do circles instead of that back and forth motion, there is no reversal point of a circle. So, you don't get that wobbling effect, which is very subtle, but it definitely makes a difference. Pencil marks are gone, and so that is done. Now for good measure, I'm just going to hit it with a 220 grit sanding block. <coughs> In this case, since the 220 grit is not really moving the wood, um, I'm just smoothing out the previous grit scratches, it doesn't really matter too much what size block I use. Um, I could use a block of the same size that I was just using, but uh, I don't have one at the moment. And I conveniently have this smaller one, which has 220 grit paper on it. So I'm just pointing that out that you don't need to be as um, meticulous about you know what you're using and how you're using it when, uh, when you're just simply progressing from the 120 to the 220. And progressing through the grits is very important for glue joints. Not to the same level often as you see people do for prep, finish prep, but in very important, with very critical glue joints, progressing to 220 grit is actually a good idea. Because wood glue works by binding the uh, wood fibers, the cellulose, together from the two pieces. So the closer those two pieces are to each other, the better the bond you get. And if you have a really rough surface, say an 80 grit surface, well, each one of those scratch marks from the 80 grit is like a, a valley and a mountain, right? If you can imagine a microscopic view of this surface, you would see a series of deep valleys cut into it, which are those grit scratches. And if you were to then take two surfaces like that and try and stick them together, those valleys and those mountain peaks 
wouldn't line up perfectly, of course, and so the two pieces would be pushed apart by um, basically the depth of the, the, the grit, the depth of those scratches. By that amount, those two pieces would be pushed apart. Actually by double, because you'd have 80 grit on each side. So if you smooth it out to 220 grit, those two pieces actually get closer together, which again, for wood glue, for tight bond, is beneficial. Okay? So that's why we progress through the grits. All right, so that scarf joint is prepared. <clears throat> While I'm here at the vise, I'll go ahead and flip this around and just prep the, uh, my bottom surface because, you know, in the end, that headstock is going to be flipped around and glued right here, and the heel block is going to be glued right here. So we're going to go ahead and just make sure that these are also flat and smooth. So once again, you can take your pencil, make a couple marks in this area, and a bunch of marks in the heel block area. And this time, since uh, this whole surface is a little bit more in the rough, I'll start with the 80 grit. Okay, that didn't take long. Now I flip this over to the 120. And then finally, a little bit of 220. Okay, same thing over here at the heel side. Okay, 120. Two twenty. Okay, cool. Let's uh, move on to the next thing here. next thing is the heel block itself so here I'll show you my whole pile here I have a whole bunch of uh, just big blocks of mahogany that I'm gonna use to cut the heel blocks out of I like to have templates for most things Instead of having to remember measurements and mark them out and everything, it's nice and easy um, when you start to develop a, a set process to just make a quick template, even for something as simple as, you know, the, the rectangle that is your heel block. So that's the template I use for this. So I can just place that on there and trace it out. First, I got to find a pencil. All right, let's find a good part of this block. Yeah, all of it looks pretty good. Well, it's all pretty well. Um, as close to quarters on as you can expect for heel block material. Okay. I'm going to go cut this on the bandsaw real quick. And actually, you guys just hang tight right here. I'll leave the camera up in this spot because I'll only be just a moment over there. All 
Okay, there it is. Uh, sorry for not taking you guys with me on that, but um, it's just a quick cut on the bandsaw. Now this is a much more appropriate size for the heel. So I have these sanding boards here, which I use for a large variety of things. Honestly, this is these sanding boards are probably the most useful tool I have in my shop. So I can't recommend enough that you guys make yourself just some reliably flat boards with some good solid uh, sandpaper attached to it. I like to use old like industrial belt sandpaper just because it is uh, it lasts a really long time so I don't have to really change this paper frequently at all it can last for I mean if you use it right you can last for years all right let's go ahead and sand our glue surface smooth So make some pencil marks on here. Once again, you can see I'm not going back and forth like this for the same reason that I described earlier. I am doing either circles or on a nice wide board like this. I like to do figure eights. If this surface was really rough, by the way, I would be hitting it on the belt sander first. But I know it's actually, it's pretty much there. It's pretty much flat, so that's why I'm starting with the hand sanding. Okay. Here's my 120 grit. And my 220. That's it. So all my surfaces are now prepared. Uh, we just have to glue it up. Uh, before I do that, though, I do. We, we're not going straight to gluing it up because there's one other small thing I have to do uh, and that's just simply I have to cut my neck blank down to the appropriate size okay basically I need to measure the distance from where the nut will be to where the end of the tenon will be and we're going to cut off the excess right now so first let's get this level stick tape off Okay, and eventually that's going to go right down there. Where's my pencil? I misplaced my pencil again. can't believe I can't find this. This is what happens when I run low on pencils. Ah, there it is. So, this is actually my fret sliding template, the kind that you can get. Uh, this one's from Stuart McDonald. You can get them from LMI or Stuart McDonald, and probably from other suppliers as well. But, um... I find it useful to write on my fret sliding template, I add some additional marks uh, just for laying out the neck. Because there are certain points like where the nut is and where the 14th fret is located that of course are right there on your fret sliding template. So if you just add 
right off of that 14th fret the appropriate distance for your tenon because again your 14th fret is the neck to body joint on most modern guitars it could be the 12th fret but that's more of a uh, an older vintage thing but in most cases nowadays it's the 14th fret on a steel string acoustic so from the 14th fret you measure out 22 millimeters is a pretty good measurement for a tenon so you could just use that 22 millimeters out add an extra mark onto your template and then you know and then you can use your template for marking out this sort of thing and then on the other end from the nut in the opposite direction you can measure out this is also a variable measurement it could be different based on what you want but you measure out four or five or six millimeters something in that range and that gives you the other side of your nut slot okay so that four or five or six millimeters would be your thickness of the nut so i'm going to start with that thickness of the nut mark right here right and then if i go there that will be my front edge of the nut which is also the beginning of my scale length the beginning of the speaking length of the string okay another useful measurement i want on here is the 14th fret location which is our neck to body joint and then that extra amount in this case 22 millimeters for the end of the tenon Go ahead and square those marks. All right. So these marks will become useful later on. Uh, the mark that's useful to us right now is this last one here for where the tenon is simply because everything beyond that is waste and we're going to go ahead and cut that off right now. Uh, once again, I'm just going to run this through the bandsaw. I'll leave you guys hanging here at the workbench. Be right back in a second. Okay, I told you that'd be quick. All right. So now we're ready to go. So I'm going to take you over to a special station that I set up just for gluing neck blanks. This is one of those things, uh, remember that question I answered earlier about space and the commenter was commenting on how unusually large my shop is, especially for just a one man show and he's absolutely correct about that. So. What you're going to see with my setup over here is something that possibly none of you will actually incorporate into your own shop, but maybe some of you will if you have an extra corner of your shop to do something like this. Uh, and what it is, is you're going to see basically a series of shelves. There'll be four shelves on, on which I have set up uh, some blocks that are in exactly the right location to do a quick and easy glue up of both the heel block and the scarf joint all at once. And this way I can do four neck blanks all at once without having to wait for the glue to dry and clear that space and then, you know, set up again for the next one. So it saves me a lot of time and it saves me a lot of space because otherwise if I were to do four neck blanks, just gluing them up here at my main benches, it would take up basically this whole long front bench space that you have here. And then I wouldn't be able to do anything else at that bench space probably for the rest of that day since I like to wait at least four hours for a glue up that is that important. 
okay? So with that in mind, let's head over there and check it out. Okay. Uh, I think you guys can see that okay. It's going to be hard for you guys to see. Um, my head is going to kind of be in the way the whole time, but I think this is, this is about as good as we can get. It's just a tricky situation being in this corner right here, as far as filming is concerned. All right, let me go grab the neck and we'll get started. So I got all my pieces. So, like I said before, I've got, let me clear this out just so you can see. All right, so I've got four of these shelves just so that I can do four blanks at a time, kind of in rapid succession uh, for the sake of, you know, efficiency here in the shop. So I'm not stuck with doing one at a time, waiting for it to dry, and then doing another. And what I've got here on this shelf is I have two blocks that are set up. They're screwed to this shelf at about the exact location that I like to use. There's a little bit of fudging around with that location for different size necks, for different models of guitars with different scale lengths or with a different um, neck to body joint, like say at the 12th fret. So this is a little bit adjustable. I'm not gonna get into how that works though, it's a little complicated, but um, just suffice it to say, you screw in these two blocks at about the precise location that you want them. And uh, I like to have this little toggle clamp here, which is good, which simply helps keep the block that's this piece, the heel block, from shimmying and swimming off its marks and upward. So normally if you didn't have this, when you glue the block down, it tends to twist up like this. But that helps keep it down, okay? By the way, there's... An Simpler way to do this without having to build this of course and I do teach that in my online course the the way of doing it uh, just with Blocks and clamps and things like that over on the workbench. This is more of my advanced um, More efficient Professional shop way of doing this Okay So let's Let's go ahead and do it then. Alright, so first of all, I have this little adjustable screw right here. There's a wing nut down here so that I can tighten this. And what I'm going to do is push this up against the block and tighten that, which will keep the block now from sliding this way. Okay? Just like that. So it's wedged in there. We can still pull it out upward so we can add the glue, but it can't just simply slide in this direction. So that way, it can't slide this way, and with this, it can't slide up. Okay, it's got nowhere to go except against the workpiece that we're gluing it to. Now on the other end, we will have our headstock piece So that's going to go like that. OK. 
Okay. Now I'm going to clamp just the neck blank piece down right now. And that's going to keep um, that's going to keep this exactly where we want it. So these two clamps are going to stay here, not as part of the, the glue joint, but just to keep the neck blank from sliding. Again, because when we add the glue and those clamps, everything's going to want to move. So two of those will take care of that. And now at this point, it doesn't matter if I start on the headstock side or if I start on the heel block side. Why don't we go ahead and do the headstock? By the way, before I proceed, I should mention that I have packaging tape under these areas. You can see it down here a little more easily. Uh, and that, of course, protects the, you know, keeps the glue from squeezing out and then sticking this to the whole board. These shelves are also, uh, what's this material? Melamine? It's like a countertop material. I, I'm not sure if... That means the right word. It's like this countertop material, so it's not prone to stick to it anyway, but I throw the packaging tape down on there also just as a little extra something, at least to keep that surface clean, even if the glue doesn't stick to it too well. So just a little extra protection. Of course, if you were using shelves that weren't this countertop material, they were just wood, it'd be even more important to put that packaging tape down to, again, keep your workpiece from being glued permanently to the shelves because that wouldn't be too cool. All right. So we'll go ahead and start with the scarf joint. So I'm going to add some glue, spread that around. Place that on there. I like to give it just a little wiggle. Um, that helps just spread the glue on the other piece so it can move around and get into the pores of the other piece there. So if you didn't do that, it wouldn't be a big deal. I'm sure, it would still be a good joint. Just a little extra assurance. Okay. Put some calls on here to protect the wood from the pressure of the clamps. And now I'm going to put my first clamp on the middle here. And before I tighten it down completely, in fact, I don't know if you can see this, as I tighten it down more, I, what you'll see is the headstock piece will start to lift up. So before you tighten it down too much, we're going to add another clamp right there and that keeps it from pushing up. Now I can tighten it down and it won't slide upward. All right, so that's our middle clamp. Now I'm just gonna put a clamp on each corner of this and that gives us a nice even distribution around the whole joint. Okay, so there we go. We've got five clamps on here, one in the middle and then one on each corner there, giving us sort of like a star pattern. And uh, let's go ahead and do a very similar thing over here at the heel block. Spread our glue. We don't have to be too careful about getting you know, the right amount of glue here, we can actually be a little excessive with it. And the extra squeeze out isn't going to cause any problems here. There we go. 
it's just a little bit of debris in that corner. Okay, place that on there. for this one as well. So I'm putting these on kind of light at first and then I'm going to go back and give them a little extra pressure at the end. bit of a tightening. Okay. All right, those all feel nice and tight. This side's good, that side's good. This is all good. This can now sit here. I mean, it's going to sit here overnight, but uh, if you were in a rush, I would say four hours would be would be good but who's in a rush with this sort of thing just leave it alone all right we're going to move on to the next one i actually already have a uh, set of pieces ready to go for the next glue up so i'll go ahead and do that i'll leave the camera running and you can watch the process a second time i'm probably not going to talk through it like i did this first time but it'll just be you know something you can uh again get to see as another iteration to help reinforce the concept in your mind. So keep watching and enjoy. Okay, and that's it. One more thing I want to say about all this, and that's that I can't stress enough the importance of a dry run with something as complex and um, just complicated by the cluttering of clamps as something like this is. So. What you saw here probably made it look a little more easy and fluid than what you'll actually encounter when you do this for the first time because I have this worked out to the point where I know exactly which size clamp to use where so that these don't conflict with each other and get in the way, okay? That's a part of this that has been worked out ahead of time that I don't even have to think about anymore. But when you do this for the first time, um, and again, you'll probably be doing this slightly differently over at your bench. If you want to know uh, the way to do this in a more detailed step-by-step -step way, get my online course, Building an OM Acoustic, and 
I will show you how to do that. But um, yeah, my, my point is do a dry run first, even with the steps in that course, you need to figure out what's going to go wrong and troubleshoot it before you actually have glue, you know, hot glue curing, you know, while you're trying to figure this whole thing out. Anyway, I hope you guys learned something there. I'm going to sign off now. Uh, this was an especially long video. I'm still feeling pretty worn out from the uh, food poisoning episode I had. I could tell even my brain fog uh, was a little bit more than it usually is, <laughs> which means it's especially bad. So it was hard for me to form sentences and really get through this whole thing. But uh, yeah, we did it and um, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.